No applause. Well, I like that. Uh, tonight, if we were on the hill, as we usually are, number one, your behinds would be awfully wet. But the sun would set about 7.09, I think, at least on my smartphone. And uh, that was a nice touch. And you can, all of you can focus your eyes on, the, uh, on what we would normally see. Actually, this has shifted over a little bit. Sunday meeting at Eagle Brook has been around as long as the school's name. And after 100 years, it looks a lot like it did in the years just before the Great Depression. No doubt, innovation and progress are important forces in institutions. And that's why we have the relatively new Evans Learning Center and the reason why the Chase Learning Center was stripped to a skeleton in the last few years. This allowed the classrooms to be rewired, reinsulated, and reconfigured. Innovation and progress are why in the summer of 2021, our information technology hardware and team was moved from the first floor of Evans to make room for spaces where students can design and construct all manner of projects. We will do this with a mixture of technology, tools, and imagination. Innovation and progress have brought high-speed internet to the dormitories and central air uh, conditioning to the dining hall. But sometimes, still, these two shaping forces need to take a back seat to the work of the human soul, to the development and expression of our deepest human emotions. You don't need your laptop or smartphone to develop your capacity for compassion and connection with others. Sunday meeting for this school and all of the 20th century, if you could travel back in time and peel back the roof of the assembly area and to peek inside, would look much like it will this year. Our underformed students sitting on the base level, surrounded by sixth formers, as you are now. And just beyond them, the faculty. There will be a speaker at the dais. The lights will be steady, but not glaring or obtrusive. Back then, you would hear more of a religious-centered talk. There would often be a song or hymn reinforcing some portion of the meeting. Now, Two decades into the 21st century, you will be seated exactly this way, unless we are lucky enough to have a meeting on the hillside. And I know we will, because it's special out there. If that's the case, you will be arranged in rows by, and by dorm. In the coming Sunday meetings, you will have to put on blue blazers and ties and wear your best shoes, unless we notify the dorms that classroom dress will do. The reason for the formal attire is probably the reason you would come up with on your own if you really thought about it. Well, Sunday meetings are important to the fabric of Eagle Brook. Ways of acknowledging that importance are to dress nicely and listen keenly. What can you expect from Sunday meeting? Well, often Miss Blaine, Mr. Sir Muddy, or I will be in front of you. We might tell a story or talk about what it means to be grateful compassionate or mindful. Other times, you will hear from other members of the Eagle Brook faculty. Recently, there have been good meetings about dealing with a tragedy in the family, perhaps a father with cancer or the unexpected loss of a loved one. Sunday meetings are meant to instruct, but the instruction is not heavy handed. I, can't, I can tell you that if you don't pay attention and you make no attempt to attempt to reflect later during the evening or during the following days, you will miss your opportunity for learning. Sunday meetings are simple and pared down for an important reason. The presenters at Sunday meeting have prepared with the adage, less is more, firmly rooted in their minds. We want you to understand the meeting topics. The object is not to confuse you, so we don't talk like professors or theologians. We want you to understand the point of, of each presentation. You should leave Sunday meeting feeling relaxed and calm. But this exercise in listening and opening your hearts should also put you in the right frame of mind to go back to your dorms after dinner and have productive study halls 
so that on Monday morning you, you wake up feeling confident about the classes you have that week. One important piece of the structure of Sunday meeting is that each one begins in silence. So if, if you could remember this key point um, in this final paragraph, each Sunday meeting begins in silence or in song, and each end in silence or song. This means we don't clap after a meeting. Remember that. We don't clap after a Sunday meeting. And, and the reason we don't clap isn't because the speaker didn't entertain us uh, or give a wonderful academic talk or both. At the conclusion of Sunday meeting, we acknowledge our speaker by not breaking the mood of reflection and introspection with applause. Now this best fits with the mood of those Sunday meetings in the 1930s, the 1970s, and the beginning of this millennium. We are supposed to feel like we have perhaps heard a sermon, a darasha, or homily. I think we can all look forward to a wide variety of Sunday meetings this year, and by being exposed to them, <clears throat> we will learn and grow and see a portion of our life's journey completed. Please join me in the responsive reading of Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. My help cometh from the Lord. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Behold, he that keepeth Israel. The Lord is thy keeper. The sun shall not smite thee by day. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. To start tonight, I want you all to take a moment to visualize what it would like, what it would be like if we were on the hillside. These gorgeous pictures should make it a little easier. In your imagination, look at your classmates and teachers around you. Feel the grass and dirt beneath you and see the hills in the distance that are being swallowed by the deepening shade as the sun sets. Maybe there's a hawk circling overhead who wonders why we are here. Then imagine yourself as part of this and notice that you are a special feature of this place, a unique element in everything that is here. You are what everyone else sees and your contribution is singular. It is untranslatable. We are all in this together, and each of us, in our own way, makes this community, this school, this world, what it is. On Sunday meetings throughout the year, many of us will share some part of who we are with you, and in doing so, we hope to increase our connections with you, enhance our relationships with each other. We, you, me, all of us are integral to this scene and to this school, which means that if we were missing from it, it would be changed. It would be less. Tonight I want to share the ending of a famous poem called Song of Myself by the great American poet Walt Whitman. In this poem, the poet speaks to many of these ideas. The picture he paints suggests that we are all connected and shows how we enrich our own lives and the lives of others 
through our connections to them, how we all contribute to the simple majesty of the world, and how we are all ultimately here for each other. Not only are we connected to other people, but we are also connected to every element of the entire world, to the grass on the ground, to the hawk in the air, to the sun that sets in the west, to the gently gathering dark, and even to the dirt on which we walk. We are part of them. They are part of us. Because of this, we are never truly alone, even when we think we are. This strikes me as a very comforting thought, and I encourage you to reflect on your importance and your connections to all that is here. There is no other you, and we, the world around you, need all that is in you for us to be complete. From Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness after the rest, and true as any in the shadowed wilds, it coaxes me to the vapor and the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health for you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. first <clears throat> Sunday meeting, usually on the hillside, is an Eagle Brook tradition. Typically, we gather high above the Deerfield River and Valley while the sun sets behind the ridge of the mountains in the west. Thousands of centuries ago, a massive body of water that today we call Lake Hitchcock filled the valley and stretched north for more than 200 miles. When you look across the valley to the row of hills, they were the shoreline of the lake, and our Mount Pecumtuck was an island. Over more centuries, the lake grew smaller, leaving behind rivers, hills, and the fertile valley where the Pecumtuck people settled in the fields near the river and planted fields of corn. Today, a walk through the village of Old Deerfield and onto the country roads takes you through present-day cornfields, growing where the Pecumtucks planted their crops. Usually each year, the new student cookout, another Eagle Brook tradition, introduces students to the woods surrounding Eagle Brook. This year we'll have to wait a little bit. And just as the Pecumtucks did 500 years ago, student roasts ears of freshly picked corn in the embers of their fires. The Pecumtucks believed that a great spirit connected everything in the world around them, the fire, the corn, land, forests, rivers, and all living creatures. 
The same natural world remains in our, on our mountainside. You will see animals here that the Pecumtuck saw every day. Squirrels, rabbits, skunks, chickmunks, a large black bear crossing the road or lying in a stream, a deer grazing outside your dorm or in a field, a fark, fox darting along a path or across a road, hawks riding thermals at the rock, a great blue heron waiting to catch a fish, an eagle soaring overhead. A founding principle of Eagle Brook is our connection to nature. You are outside every day, in every season. You walk to meals, to sports, to classes, to dorms, and on weekends into the thousand surrounding acres to hike, camp, ride bicycles, and explore. Howard Gibbs, Eagle Brook's founder, chose this mountainside for his school. It was the perfect place to put into practice his ideas about education for young boys and our faculty daughters. He believed that a close connection to nature was essential for learning skills, having success in classes, and developing values. It is a tradition for schools to have mottos, words of, or phrases that simplify the school's deepest values and goals. Many of the mottos, like Eagle Brooks, are in Latin. Our motto, motto Lumen, Fides, Labor, Facta, is a roadmap for our everyday life here at Eagle Brook. Every student should learn these four words, Lumen, Fides, Labor, Facta. Our motto is a roadmap that will give your life direction. Lumen is Latin means light. At Eagle Brook, that light is your curiosity. Be curious. Explore new subjects. Learn new talents. Try new sports. Make new friends. That spark of curiosity is a foundation for creativity, innovation, and imagination. Curiosity is a drive that makes you question, challenge ideas, and explore new possibilities. Fides is Latin, means loyalty. At Eagle Brook, loyalty is derived from respect. Respect everyone for who they are, even when they are different from you, even when, they don't, even when you don't agree with them. Respect yourself. When you understand who you are, it is easy to have respect for others. Mutual respect is the spirit of Eagle Brook. Labor is, in Latin means work. At Eagle Brook, work means engagement. Get involved and engage students' focus is on the positive. Throw yourself into your teams, classes, activities, dorm life, and friendships. If you are invested, you are more likely to get good grades, have close friends, and behave with thoughtfulness towards others. Facta in Latin means the collection of everything that you do. And at Eagle Brook, what you do needs balance. You have so many opportunities here to achieve and find success. The curriculum promotes a broad range of knowledge, skills, subjects, electives, sports, and activities. Sample as many as possible. They will, ex they will extend knowledge and understanding and improve skills. Lumen days, labor, facta. Curiosity, respect, engagement, and balance. Use these basic values in our motto as a guide for a productive and fulfilling life. The Pecumtucks used animals, like we use Latin words, to symbolize their values. One of their stories was about porcupines. A little animal you might see on a climb to the rock, porcupines are dark colored and covered in sharp quills. A baby porcupine is very cute, a prickly round ball. A full grown porcupine is a fearsome animal, large, maybe two feet long and weighing 25 pounds and covered with 30,000 quills. My little terrier, Raleigh, encountered one. That will be another story. 
This evening, the story is a Pocomtuck story about porcupines. Many years ago, winter on Mount Pocomtuck was so cold that many animals were freezing and dying on our hillside. In those days, porcupines were very clever. They dug burrows along the Pocomtuck Ridge and crawled underground to stay warm. But the days and nights grew colder and colder. Remember that porcupines are clever. They all crawled into one huge, deep burrow. As the days and nights grew even colder, they edged closer together. They were warm and cozy, but it grew even colder. To stay warm, they had to wiggle even closer together, so close that they were jabbing each other with their sharp quills. Remember, each porcupine had 30,000 quills, which is a lot of sharp jabs. They began to squabble. What to do? The jabs hurt. Should they move apart and live alone? Maybe to freeze and die? Or could they continue to live together if they learn to tolerate a little discomfort caused by their companions? After much porcupine debate, they reached a decision. We must accept the little jabs from our fellow porcupines. We need the warmth that comes from each other. <clears throat> The story taught the Pocomtucks a lesson. To have a strong community, people, people must learn to live together and understand that relationships are never perfect. Before I offer our final prayer, 
or we're coming to the close of this first Sunday meeting, which is really a, a very important tradition for me. Um, and for those who have gone before you, to remember that Sunday night to end the week or begin the week um, with this time together uh, really focuses us as a community on the things that we feel. Not that we're thinking, not that we're learning, but that we feel. Connects us with things that we can't actually, we don't have to explain. So sometimes just sitting in quiet helps us to do that. Figure out just that feel. Not a thinking thing, not a doing thing, just being. Before we leave, I'm going to offer a blessing and we're going to sit quietly for just a moment. <coughs> then, because we are in this space this evening, um, not like we would at the, out on the hill, those of you who remember it last year and years before, we're dismissed in a different way. We're dismissed on our own reconnaissance. We, we get to decide when we leave. But tonight, we're going to dismiss in the same manner that we dismiss for, um, for assembly tomorrow morning. We've just practiced that. But I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you if you could practice the quiet that I just spoke of as you leave. And hold your conversation. Hold your reflections that you want to share with your friends or that you, questions that you might have that have nothing to do with this evening's program. Hold them until you've left the building, not just the not just the room, the building. If you do that, that would be very nice. The other last thing I would ask is that you pick up your card, and as you're leaving, the, the um, student council will be in the foyer, and they'll pick them up from you. They'll, they'll take them. So if you would hand them to the sixth form student council members there, okay, as you're leaving. Let us pray. We open ourselves to the fellowship and grace that comes when we are gathered to reflect on community, on beginning a new year, on the blessings that come to us in this life that we receive without asking. We celebrate the life we share together and the gifts that we can offer one another. We give thanks and we ask for guidance. Guide us, Lord, as we pick our way through each day helping us to feel our way through darkness and seek light. Face our fears and challenges while holding steadfast to what is most important to us. Grant us strength and patience when we meet with adversity, discomfort, distress, and direct us to those moments of joy, places of beauty, and measures of peace. Help us to see where we can serve one another with compassion and generosity. Lord, in giving us reason and the power to understand and create, you have made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence so to use the resources of nature that we will learn to nurture and respect the earth, this earthly home that generations yet to come may continue to enjoy. Grant us the determination of the tide, the patience of the mountains, hearts open like the sky above. Watch over us, Lord, and help us to fly with the wings of an eagle, to see with the eyes of an owl. May we encounter joy in each day. May we find peace in every hour. May we seek love in each moment. Amen. <laughs>